Well, I'll tell you what. I, uh, my dad was a automobile man. I got through uh, school and we got through uh, being able to eat after we lost a job up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He had moved down to Delaware because uh, my cousin selling General Motors products. And so uh, I've known in my state used to have the largest percentage of auto workers of any state in the nation because we had a small population and the largest General Motors and the largest pressure plant outside of Michigan and, and uh, Ohio. And uh, I, saw, I saw what happened when we got hit very hard. We lost both those plants. Let me show it off by saying, Mr. Mayor, thanks for the passport into your city. And Marcy, you've been a friend a long time. Thank you for your introduction. Yay, Marcy! There's no more fierce defender. The people she grew up with than Marcy. She has never, ever, ever forgotten where she came from. She's tough. She's, she's, she's a straight shooter. She's influential in Congress. She's honest, and she sees you. You're always in her view. Tony, Mr. President, I know you're new, and he said, piece of cake, so I don't have to worry if I get elected the first time I say it. We're all kidding aside, Tony, thank you for hosting us, and thank you for Local 14. And Kenyatta, you, uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, all you did for Barack and me when we were running, when we got elected, jumping in and being part of helping us govern, you remind me of something my dad said. He said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about your place in the community. It's about respect. It's about being able to say to your kid and look him in the eye and say, it's going to be okay and mean it. That's what job's about. A decent paying job like the UAW provides. This lesson I grew up with, surrounded by hardworking families in Scranton, and then in Claymont, Delaware, we had to move. Dad lost work, there was no work in Scranton. Just like here in Toledo. The times are hard. Unemployment is way up due to the pandemic and the terrible way in which it's been handled. The economic outlook remains uncertain. Across Ohio and the country, folks are worried about making the next mortgage payment or the rent payment. Whether or not they can purchase their prescription drugs or be able to put food on the table. Literally, worried about whether their kids' school is open and be able to stay open. And if they're not open, how they can go to work if they have a job and still take care of their kids. They see the people at the very top doing better than they ever have, while they're left to wonder, who's looking out for me? That's Donald Trump's presidency. 215,000 dead because of COVID. Experts say we're likely to lose another 200,000 people in the next few months unless we take some serious action. And he doesn't know what he's doing. All because this president's only worried about one thing, the stock market. He refuses to follow the science. It's estimated that if we just wore these masks nationally, we'd save over 100,000 lives between now and the end of the year. This president knew back in January he was briefed in detail by the intelligence community how extremely dangerous this COVID virus was, how communicable the disease was. He went to the taped interview with Bob Woodward, a leading journalist. It's on tape, but played, telling Woodward that he knew how dangerous the disease was, but did nothing. Ask yourself, why didn't he tell us? Why didn't he warn us? He said nothing. He told Woodward, he didn't want to panic the American people. That's why he said nothing. We don't panic. America doesn't panic. What Trump panicked, his reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis has been unconscionable. The longer Donald Trump is president, the more reckless he seems to get. Dr. Fauci, the most respected doc on this issue in the world, in the country, he, he told the president, you know, the president's announcement of his pick for the Supreme Court in the Rose Garden, as he referred to that as a super spreader. All those people caught, that got the disease. How's he responding? 
Well, guess what? He's now running an ad you probably saw. The National Act quoting Dr. Fauci out of context. Way back in March, referring to public health officials, Dr. Fauci said, I can't imagine that anybody could be doing more, end of quote. In the recent ad that's going out nationally, Trump had quotes Dr. Fauci is saying that about him, the president. Trump and his campaign deliberately lied, making it sound like Fauci was talking about Trump. Fauci went on the public air and the ad came out saying three days ago, I did not give permission for that quote. He wasn't referring to the president. And even after that, Fauci said he didn't say that the president and the campaign, even after Fauci laid this out, the campaign said, we're still going to use it because he did say it, even though it wasn't about him. The point I'm trying to make is, it was a knowing lie, like we're being told about everything about this COVID consequences. As a consequence to his months of overwhelming lie and misleading irresponsible action on the part of Donald Trump, how many empty chairs were around your breakfast table this morning? Someone you loved, someone you cared about, someone you knew, a family member or a neighbor, missing, missing. Why? Because of negligence. Look, I view this campaign, as I've said before and I'll say it again, between Strand and Park Avenue, between Toledo and Park Avenue, all Trump can see is from Park Avenue is Wall Street. That's why his only metric for American prosperity that he values is the Dow Jones and the index. Like a lot of you, I spent a lot of my time with guys like Trump looking down on me. The Irish Catholic kid in the neighborhood. Guys who thought they were better than me because they had a lot of money. Guys who inherited everything they ever got still manage to squander it. I have to admit, I shouldn't have done it, but I've on record saying it, so I'll repeat it. I still have a little bit of chip on my shoulder about guys like him. I read some stories after I got the nomination that, quote, if Biden gets elected, he'll be the first non-Ivy League school graduate to get elected. You know, South Carolina was 80 or 90 years. Guys have a seat, man. You know what? Like some state school guy went to the University of Delaware, I'm proud of it. Hard to get there, hard to get through in terms of money. But folks, since when can someone who went to a state university not be qualified to be president? Folks, I know what it takes to be president. I sat next to a man for eight years watching and participating. My mom taught me. Probably taught by your parents too. Say, Joey, nobody is better than you, but everybody's your equal. I don't measure people based on the size of their bank account. I don't respect people based on whether they own a mansion. I don't judge them whether they're based on whether they belong to a country club. You and I measure people by the strength of their character, their honesty, their their courage, their courage. My mom used to say the greatest gift of all, the greatest virtue is courage. You're redeemed by your courage. That's what she's saying, redeemed by your loyalty. Honesty, loyalty, things that are bigger than yourself. In the neighborhoods we were raised in. It's all about family, decency, honor, opportunity. These are the values I learned growing up in Scranton. My guess is you learned growing up in Toledo, wherever you grew up. The people I grew up in the Strand didn't have any money in stocks. In our house growing up, every penny my dad made went to paying the bills, keeping the lights on, and food at the table. Every penny our friends in Strand made went to paying the bills and taking care of their families as well. And we looked out for our neighbors. That's why I have a different measure by which I judge the health of America's economy. I see hard-working women and men are just trying to earn an honest living to take care of their families. Just want an even shot. They're not asking for anything, they're just, just asking for a fair shot. And you know, given a shot, the American people never, ever, ever, ever let their country down. Never. 
another expression my dad would have is that when you see the abuse of power, there's only one way to respond to it, and that's with power. And the only power we have to take on corporate America is union power. That's the only power. and I were elected and we inherited the worst recession short of a depression in history. The president put me in charge of the Recovery Act. $800 billion was needed to save our economy from going into depression. We did it with less than two tenths of one percent waste or fraud. We were able to see to it that Ohio and other states received substantial assistance to address their economic pain, to recover and rebuild, to make sure we kept teachers, firefighters, and cops public nurses on the job, people being laid off now because you don't have the local money to do it. So they didn't have to be fired because of lack of money. That was the federal government stepped up and started the longest sustained economic recovery in American history that this guy inherited and then squandered again. But you know what Mitch McConnell said recently about helping the states and cities? He said, quote, let them go bankrupt. I heard that before. You heard it too. Republicans said the same thing about the automobile industry. Like I said, I come from an automobile state and an automobile man. The auto industry supported one in eight Ohioans. was on the brink. It was more than 10 years ago, but you remember, like it was yesterday, it was on the brink. But Brock and I bet on you and the American worker and it paid off. I argued an American worker was the finest auto worker in the world. Management screwed it up. You did. You didn't make the mistake. And by the way, it all got paid back. But guess who made the greatest sacrifices? Auto worker. You made the sacrifices to get it back. So it's over. Over the many objections of many that we stepped in and rescued the automobile industry. General Motors and Chrysler saving one billion jobs. And then what happened when Donald Trump came to office? Remember what Trump said in 2017 to Lawrencetown? He said, don't move. Well, don't move, don't sell your house. Well, Lawrencetown shut down on Trump's watch. And after a decade in Cleveland, I met, after debating Cleveland, I met with an elementary school teacher in Lawrencetown. Her husband there as well, one of the workers who lost his job in Lordstown. He had to accept the transfer to a plant in Kentucky eight hours away, one way, to maintain his health care and his pension. He drives 16 hours a weekend to see her and their two kids. But Donald Trump betrayal doesn't stop there. He betrayed union workers at Goodyear when he called for a boycott buying tire, Goodyear tires because of a personal grudge. He passed the tax bill for the super wealthy corporations and actually provided incentives for companies to move jobs overseas. Folks, manufacturing is the backbone of America. But we're in a manufacturing recession because of Donald Trump even before the COVID virus hit. We're down 647,000 manufacturing jobs nationwide since the crisis started. And our balance of payments, meaning we're sending more overseas than coming to us, I mean, the more we're buying more overseas than we're selling, is higher than it's been in a long time. There's still 10,900 lost auto worker manufacturing jobs in Ohio not come back. The Trump president will be the first president since Herbert Hoover over 90 years ago first president of modern history to leave office with fewer jobs than he had when he came to office. Donald Trump's only plan is more tax cuts for the wealthy. Most of you, if you sold a job, paid more than he paid last year in taxes. $750? Come on. The system's rigged. We're going to change it. $30 billion new proposal just for the gains of the 100 richest billionaires in America. 30 billion. Hear me? They made 30 billion dollars alone in this year. 
while the rest of the people are getting killed. In the middle of this pandemic, why do Republicans have time to hold a hearing on the Supreme Court providing, instead of the, providing a significant economic need for localities? I'll tell you why. It's about finally getting his wish to wipe out the Affordable Health Care Act. Because their nominee has said in the past that the law should be struck down. His relentless effort to eliminate the Affordable Care Act provided health care coverage for 20 million people who didn't have it. Protects us from well over 100 million people with pre-existing conditions. You know, and we've seen his pledge, quote, to terminate the tax dedicated to financing Social Security. Marcy and I were talking about that. You know what the actuary of the Social Security Department said? If it goes through, this tax is talking about cutting for the Social Security. It will actually bankrupt, bankrupt Social Security by the middle of 2023. Go home and tell your parents that. Not once has President Trump called for a high-level meeting between Democrats and Republicans in the White House. This is going on now. The House already passed back in the beginning of the summer. This petition to be able to reconcile people who are real trouble, get help to states like we did. He had once called a meeting between Democrats and Republicans to deliver the new COVID relief package for working families and small businesses that are going bankrupt. He spent too much time in the bunker of his golf course or the bunker of the White House and he was willing to actually sit and try to work something out. Check it out. First president I can ever remember in the middle of the national economic crisis did not try to call the parties together. He turned his back on you. I promise you I will never do that. It's time to reward work, not wealth. Work. I mean it. An independent analysis by a big Wall Street firm called Moody's, not a Democratic think tank, they did an analysis of my economic plan to revive this country, an analysis of his. Here's what they concluded, that my plan will create 18.6 million jobs in the next four years. Seven million more than the president's economic plan. It would generate economic growth of an additional trillion dollars more than the president's plan. Look what these guys don't get. When you do well, when my family does well, everybody does better. Everybody does better. This is God's truth. Here's how my plan works. I'm not going to raise taxes on anyone who makes less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. If you make more than four hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to raise your taxes. You make it over four hundred. But look, you're not going to pay a penny more. In fact, tens of millions of middle-class families are going to get a tax cut when they need it most. And raising their kids, trying to get affordable health care, buying their first home, or saving for retirement. When I'm going to ask big corporations and super wealthy just to get to start to pay their fair share, I'm going to raise back the tax cut he gave for corporate America. They're paying the mid 30s, they're not paying 21. So we just raised the tax back to what it should be 28%. That generates over $100 billion. You hear me? That's money. I mean, excuse me, one point. Three trillion dollars. That's what it raises to help hardworking folks. Allow us to invest in working people, and grow the middle class, make sure everybody comes along this time. My plan will create a million good paying union jobs, manufacturing, and building products and technology that we need now and in the future. Spend 600 billion dollars just making sure that we have 
ships and planes, cars, trains, all the things the government lets contracts for. But well, I promise you this, every single product, every single contract you let, will be only let to a company or a firm that makes it in America from beginning to end. Not a joke. American jobs. We'll invest to build more resilient infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports. 1.5 million new affordable housing units. High-speed broadband in every American household. More important than ever. We're going to rebuild crumbling schools. Retrofit 4 million buildings. Weatherize 2 million homes, creating 1 million new jobs. Raise why everyone from the electric works to every other major union is strongly supporting us. It's all going to be done by certified union labor. Promise. You remember when the president put me in charge of that $800 billion, not one single contract went out that was a prevailing wage. Not one. So we're going to end Trump's new incentive for sending jobs abroad. That's what he's done. More jobs are going abroad now. Any company that offshores a job is going to pay a 10% penalty. Any company that brings back a job, reopens a closed factory, like a manufacturing company, they'll get a 10% credit for their investment. We're going to make trade. This <laughs> trade strategy fights for every American worker and every American job and actually get results. Not Trump's chaotic trade war, erratic tweets of bluster that's only stiffed American workers and consumers, including farmers. He's let you down. He's let us down. I promise you, I will stand up to China's trade abuses and I will invest in the American worker. Because I know no one, nobody can outcompete an American worker when they've gotten a fair shot. Nobody in the world. One more thing. The United States government owns and maintains an enormous fleet of vehicles. We're going to convert many of them to electric vehicles, and you're going to still need to build these transmissions for a long time to come. And any new jobs in that area are going to go to people who in the automobile industry, who are in the manufacturing, who in the UAW, are going to be making these new vehicles. Sourced right here in America. The government will provide demand support to retool factories that are struggling to compete. The U.S. auto industry will step up. I'll expand capacity so the United States, not China, leads the world in modern new technology. We're going to make it easier for American consumers to move in vehicles for the future. By building a network of 500,000 charging stations across the country, offering consumers rebates to swap older, fuel-efficient cars, we're going to move in the direction that technology is taking us and making sure the UAW leads the way in how we do it. Together, this will mean one million good new jobs in the auto industry. Folks, it's an example of how we can do anything. I'm more optimistic about what we have a chance to do in the next four to six years, eight years, than anything, any time in my whole career. The blinders have been taken off the American people. They see the combination of the pandemic, the economic crisis, the racial inequality of this, what's going on.
if we can do it together. Nothing can stop us. You know, we have to come together, and that's why I'm running. I'm running as a proud Democrat for the Senate. When I run as a proud Democrat for Vice President, I'm running as a proud Democrat for President. As an American president, I'll govern for everyone who voted for me as well as against me. We can be better than what we've seen. We can be what we are at our best. The United States of America. So vote.